everybody, and welcome back to another episode. I'm your host, Brandon Cobb, co-founder of HPG Capital, and today I've got Shauna on the show. She is a two-time published author, the founder of Tax Goddess Business Services. Tax Goddess, get this, it's a fully digital firm with a skilled team of over 65 people worldwide. They've saved their clients billions in taxes. She advises business owners, investors, entrepreneurs, I mean, you name it, she's ranked in the top 1% of tax strategists in the USA and has been featured on tons of platforms. I mean, just to name a couple Forbes, CNN, Money, Entrepreneur, CBS, Fox. I mean, all the big names. Shauna, it's great to have you on. Welcome to the show. Oh, thanks so much for having me. I'm super excited to be here today. Yes, there's a lot of really great stuff that I want to get to. You're very unique in your niche. I've talked to a lot of accountants. I've talked to a lot of tax people before. And I'm, there's I'm sorry, some very... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it's it's a good thing, right? If you're paying taxes, that's a good problem to have. You know, there's worse problems to have, but Absolutely. if you can save that money, which I'm sure you're going to share some ways today, that's what we want to do. For those yes. that don't know who you are, tell us your story and how you got here. Absolutely. So I'll try to keep it quick. Uh, I actually started off in astrophysics, of all things. Uh, number brain really loves solving puzzles. So very long story short, uh, my mom, my goddess, ended up getting a notice from the IRS. She was not happy. And as any good daughter... I'm going to fix it. So come about three, four, five, six, seven years later, I am now starting to rank, switched from astrophysics to tax, starting to rank in the world of tax strategy and got mom down to a 6.92% tax rate. And uh, she's very pleased with her daughter. And so of course, now we do this for everybody else, which is good stuff. So that is super cool. I know that you're known for helping $100 million companies unlock a 6% annual tax rate. And there's some pointers here that entrepreneurs, you know, six, seven figure business owners can take from this. What is that? Oh, where do you want to start? So I think the biggest thing for me is people don't really seem to understand the difference between a CPA, their day-to-day, -day, the person that files the tax returns, gives them advice throughout the year, and an actual tax strategist. So when you look at people that do what I do, okay, according to Google, there are 665,000 CPAs in the US. They do all sorts of things, controllers, yeah. taxes, auditors, all the deal. You've got 60,000 that have masters in taxation. That's the first level of specializing in tax. You then get 607 certified tax coaches, CTC, CTP, CTS, which is the top of the top of the top of this little pyramid. There's only 15 people with the CTS designation. And so oh. a lot of taxpayers don't even really realize, you know, when you ask them, well, so who's giving you the tax strategy? Oh, my CPA handles that. Ooh, it always makes me want to kind of suck through my teeth there, right? Because those are the cases where we see you've gotten what we call the low hanging fruit, right? We've put the kids on payroll. You bought that big SUV last year. You set up a defined benefit plan, uh, but you're not seeing the big dollar strategies out there. Uh, that, a, that a tax strategist focus on. So that's really where we start looking. Who has a strategist, doesn't have a strategist. Next piece is what is your aggression level? So in our world, there's a zero to 10 scale. Zero meaning the IRS never calls you never ever. 10 meaning we're all going to jail. Right. And okay. that's, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we and we have to know, right? Because Brandon, you may be, maybe you're a level eight, right? We're, we're not going to jail. I always tell people red and orange do not go well together, okay? So we're, we're not going to jail. A nine is Al Capone doing some shady stuff, all right? An eight is you're okay getting a call from the IRS because you have everything documented, T's crossed, I's dotted, right? You know what you're doing. You've got it clear. All your documentation is perfect, right? And the scale goes down from there. So most entrepreneurs, most business owners are going to be at a level seven, eight, right? Otherwise, they wouldn't be entrepreneurs in the first place. And it's very important for your tax strategy team to know where you are, because I can give you level eight strategies. But if you're a level two or your spouse is a level two, maybe we need to dial it back to a four or a five because they're signing the return as well. So 
What was that certification that 15 people have? You said it was CTS? CTS, Certified Tax Strategist. It's, Certified Tax Strategist, okay. You got it. Yep, there's, there might be 16. I think they just inducted somebody new. Uh, but yeah, we, we you all- You have one of these? Is that... I'm CTS, yeah. CPA, wow. MTAC, CTC, CTP, CTS, baby. So yeah, that's how we're in the top 1%. It's actually 0. 0.000002 something or whatever. Uh, yeah. But yeah. They rank us based on how much money we save and the types of work we do. So that's really cool. Okay. Yeah. So the better you perform, the better ranking that you the get better on better ranking we get. Yeah. So the these one hundred million dollar companies, like, you know, walk us through this six percent annual tax rate oh, and wow. how you know, business owners, you know, doing six, seven figures can can learn from this and maybe take advantage. You got it. So absolutely dependent on the size of the company, right? So a six-figure company versus a 10-figure company are going to have very different strategies that we use. The second piece we always look at is what is the net profit? Because you can have a six-figure company taking home a 40% profit because one guy's running it, right? Yeah. You can have a $100 million company taking home a 1% net profit, still right. a big number, but very different in the ways and strategies we use. So if we start, let's say we start looking at that smaller side, the six and seven figures, right? We already talked about some of the baselines, buying the car, paying the kids, uh, master's exemption, right? The current, and especially I know because we have a lot of real estate folks here, right? Using that 14 days free, the average rate that we're seeing, depending on where you are in the country, ranges anywhere from $1,000 a night all the way up to, I think the highest was nineteen eight in uh, New York. That was in Manhattan. Almost $20,000 times 14 days a year of completely tax-free income as a deduction for your business. Who wouldn't take a quarter of a million of dollars of just free cash in their pocket, right? It's a really mm -hmm. cool thing. Um, but as you start to get bigger, you start looking at, all right, what about a captive? Uh, now this is a big, you know, would you say, what was that word? Ooh, captive, a captive, captive. Okay. Captive. Yeah. So there are different levels of captives. Again, are we in the hundred million dollar company or in the, you know, hundred thousand dollar company, different levels of captives. You can have micro captives. You can have reinsurance. You can own a private captive, right? And those depend on the size of the business, but effectively what you're doing. So everybody listening, I'm sure has a car. And we all drive yeah. cars. We're all paying car insurance, right? How often, if you've ever had an accident, how often do you actually get paid out what you paid into the insurance company over the 20 years? Never. Otherwise, insurance companies would even be in business. Yeah. And voila. And so this is one of the big benefits. A captive is a type of insurance company. So you can actually set up your own insurance company for your auto, for your business liability, for your E&O, uh, to cover your rental properties, right? Your insurance company, you can pay yourself the insurance. And when and if something happens, the once in 15 years you get into an accident, you can pay yourself out. So there's a lot of really cool ways to put money aside. And for example, that captive money is never taxable, never, ever, never, ever, never again. So you mm -hmm. get a deduction. Yeah, it's a write-off. It's a write-off that's going right into your your bank account. What happens if, let's say, you you know you open up an active account and you, you know, it's your own insurance policy, and so it's going out of your personal bank account and into this captive bank account, and then you get into a wreck, and the costs of the wreck are more than you have in that Ooh. bank account. And so this is why there's three different levels of captives, right? With micro captives, they pool your risk with other micro captives. Okay, so you may have 2,000 micro captives and they're all putting into a pooled risk. All 2,000 of you are not having problems at the same time. Okay, now normally I should say this is related to business risk. Okay, uh, during the years of COVID, when everybody got shut down for the first year and nobody could open and everybody had losses and all these problems, okay, uh, many of the captives went under because there was such a large risk right? Everybody had issues in the same year. So it can happen. You're right. Has it happened? Mm, not really. Even during captive or even during COVID, I think we only saw two of the very, very, very large captives go down. And that was a pretty significant event. 
So for day-to-day -day business risks, right? Um, like if we're thinking Airbnb and somebody canceled on you and they had booked two weeks during the Super Bowl and that was your I big see. revenue source, not everybody's going to have that at the same time. Now, when you start getting up to the $100 million revenue companies, right? When you have an own, your own private captive, the thought here is, is that you are allocating risk across multiple different lines of insurance. Okay? Captives only work if the business risk is real, right? So for example, the famous example, you had a rancher who had all of his cattle up on top of a mesa, right? Very tall, flat mountain. Okay? He bought flood insurance. There's no floods on top of a mesa, okay? The IRS didn't like that. It wasn't a real business risk. And I think this is one of the biggest issues where people get into trouble, right? Captives are currently listed on the IRS's dirty dozen list. And this is why you have to understand the difference between a CPA who kind of knows stuff and a strategist who can point what you should yeah. do and what you should not do, right? Um, is because people were using captives in this particular instance to do bad things, right? To get insurance, pay premiums on things that were not a real risk. So. Does captives apply to any insurance, like workers comp, general liability? Wow. Any of the business okay. lines. Any so those are all lines. business, those are all heavy business expenses. Yes, yes. And they're write-offs essentially under a captive. You got it. You got it. And so really the question becomes, and, and I'm so sorry, we're like deep diving on this one strategy. Just side yeah. note, there's about 1,500 strategies that applies to every business. <laughs> so oh, wow. there's, there's a lot of options. We may need, may need to get back on the phone again, Brandon, at some point in the future. But so if you've only got the captive, right, you also want to look at how much can you get that, ins that same insurance for, right? Let's say you're doing workers' comp, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, there's big companies, Hartford, right? If Hartford's only going to charge you $1,000 to get your workers' comp, you will not be able to write off more than $1,000 going into your own insurance. Got to be in market, sure. Got to be market, right? Maybe a little more because you're a little more risky, you know, like this kind of thing, but it's got to be market. So another pitfall of using the captives if you don't do them right. So. Okay, got it. I interrupted you. So you were telling the different strategies for this oh, how $100 sorry. million companies get down to 6%. <laughs> yeah. So we, we yeah. covered the captive. Anything covered next? Captive. Yeah. Well, I think one of the things that people miss is actually entity formation, entity mm -hmm. structuring. Okay. Uh, one of the best ways to reduce taxes, especially if you have family members, okay, or I should say people that are willing to work with you on the tax front, okay, uncles, best friends, this kind of thing. The use of family limited partnerships to reduce the value of a company to be able to sell the stock, okay? Um, the creation of a C corporation versus an S corporation. One of the most standard things we see these days is people are S corps, but a C corp has a maximum tax rate of 21%. S corps, at the moment, California can go all the way up to 63. So just the right kind of entity structuring. Uh, ownership by the children, right? Uh, ownership by irrevocable trusts. The use of life insurance to purchase, you know, put money into life insurance, get the tax-free growth, and use the same money to pass on to the heirs or to give to charity or to create the FLP and fund the items and all these kinds of things. So entity structuring is massive. The third one that I always love hitting on since I just mentioned kids is what is your goal as an individual? Okay. So some people are all about charity. Some people want to build up a big retirement, go live on a beach and spend it down to zero, you know, slide into the grave with two pennies to their name. Right. Some people want to build an empire. Right. So I want to pass on $10 million worth of assets to my kids. I expect, and I am training my children to take that 10 million and build it to 30 and to take that 30 and build it to 100, and to take that 100 and to build it to 500, right? And how do you do that, right? That's a little more complicated because not only are you looking at the actual tax strategies themselves, you also have to build in training and education for family members, right? Because mm -hmm. we've all seen the one bad apple where somebody gets a hold of money, buys a Ferrari and wrecks it every yeah, two years, right? Yeah. You don't want to do that. Don't want to do that. So. 
Yeah, I think one of the most underlooked tax strategies is actually the use of multiple entities and the ownership of multifamily members to spread the tax rate out across people, right? Basic things, if you're a smaller company, get the kids on payroll, right? I know it kind of hit on that a little earlier, but did you know that the current maximum amount that you can pay a child, age of seven, $43,000 a year, most people are paying their kids about three or 4,000. So there's always different ways to skin that cat. Yeah. Very interesting. And I mean, let's say it goes into your kid's account and it, it, it just sits there and then the kid will get taxed at a much lower tax rate and you can kind of keep it for them up until like they turn 18 or something like that. So let's play games with some kids payroll. Okay. So the 43,000 number is based on three separate numbers being added together. Okay, the first one is the basic standard deduction. At the moment, it's about thirteen eight fifty. Okay, on top of that, you have a, a traditional or a Roth IRA. It's another seven, so we're at about twenty. Okay, and on top of that, if your company has a four hundred one k plan or a defined benefit plan, cash balance, you know, whatever kind of retirement accounts, that's typically around another twenty three thousand. So that's where we get to our forty three thousand. Okay? Makes sense. Now you're right, we can absolutely pay them more than that. And some parents will do that, right? Especially if the kids are in college, you know, they're 18, 19, 20, they have their own expenses, room, board, tuition, you know, all these things, right? And that money, you might as well at least get the deduction by paying the kid before you pay it to college, right? Why yeah. not? Now, when they're younger, and this is one of the things that I love about the tax code and the time value of money, right? The, the power of compounding. If you've got a seven-year-old, that's that's typically when you can start to pay them. If you've got a seven-year-old, you put 23000 into the 401k, right? You've put 7000 into a traditional IRA. They've got $30,000 every single year from the age of seven compounding towards retirement, okay? So I'm, I don't even have those calculations, but big yeah. numbers, right? The 13850 that is the standard deduction. Now, you have really two options with that, and I've seen parents go either direction. I've seen some parents say, listen, this is your money. You get to spend it on anything other than food, clothing, and shelter. Those are the three main categories that as a parent, for any child mm -hmm. under 18, you you can't charge your kids rent to stay in your house. <laughs> you can't? Dang it. We've tried. They, they Until tried. they turn 18, right? <laughs> the day they turn 18, totally different issue. But Fair yeah, game. Under, under 18, nothing about food, clothing, shelter. But kids are expensive, right? We've got music. We've got karate. They need an iPad for school. They want special clothes. They want the newest pair of Nikes. It's your money. Do what you want to with it. Here's the deal. However, child, remember I talked about building empires and training them, right? Mm -hmm. If we take your 13000 a year, you keep... 1,850. Okay. So we're, we're going to take 12. We're going to put that 12 into an infinite banking, into life insurance for you. Mm -hmm. The compounding value of a child putting in $12,000 a year into a life insurance policy, by the time they hit 45, they already have over $2.3 million of an asset that they can borrow. They can buy a house. They can put down down payments on real estate. They could start a business. They could do whatever they want to with it. So there are some amazing things you can do in both teaching the child and setting up your kids and their kids for success. So, Wow. And so all of these principles or these strategies, this is what you utilize when you're working with these $100 million companies because it's just – I can see the huge value, especially in the insurance, being able to write that off. I don't know. Yeah, like insurance is like a huge one, especially workers' yeah. comp insurance. Um all day. I definitely don't want to stop the train there. Were there any other points around this before uh, we- How, how much time next? do we have? You tell me. Maybe the way to do this is for anybody, you know, the, the book that we just wrote last year, it's called The 6% Life. It actually outsold Think and Grow Rich as the top Amazon bestseller for three weeks. I was very proud of that one. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's got seven strategies in it uh, that, that are the ones that we consider the low hanging fruit. So if you are working with your CPA and they have- haven't brought these to you, you know, and we love CPAs. We need CPAs. Okay. We, I'm a CPA. We focus on tax strategy. We work with your CPA, right? Yeah. We can be your new CPA if you need that, but we like to work with the CPA. So sure. that might be the best place to start to kind of get an idea. Okay. It talks about the pitfalls. Um, if, if you've already done all seven of those, 
let us know. We'll give you some more. <laughs> All right, cool. So we okay. got the book. We'll make sure that gets posted in the show notes. So for those that, you know, this is a whole different world, right? There, again, there's a difference between a tax coach and a tax strategist and a, and a CPA. Most people have just normal CPAs. How do you know if someone's listening to this, how do they know if their accountant is leaving money on the table if they're not getting the bang for the buck? Because you don't know if you don't know. And a lot of people, once they choose a CPA, they're with them for life, right? Yeah, that's that's their person, 100%. And, and side note, rightly, you should be, right? If you like the person, you've never been audited as, as a CPA tax preparer. If you like them, they're giving you good advice, you've never been audited for filing your taxes, sounds like a great person. And that's why we love CPAs. You need those people in your life, right? So how do you know if you're leaving money on the table? Now, a couple, some questions are very specific for the industry, okay? If you're in real estate and you go to your CPA and you say, okay, I'm in real estate. I've heard about this thing called cost segregation. Explain it to me. And their eyes go blank. You need to <laughs> run yeah. away. Okay? Yeah. They, they are not doing, you're not doing justice. Uh, same in the real estate industry. If you ask them about the Schedule C, Schedule C Airbnb specialty for being real estate, right? If they don't know what that is, run away. Okay. These, these are two main things and these are, these are basic low hanging fruit. Okay. Hmm. Now, if you want to know in any other business, right, am I leaving money on the table? To me, this is always a question of, when you read an article, when you listen to this podcast and you hear about captive and you hear about um, oil and gas you know, investments and you hear about historic preservation, conservation easements, these kinds of things, and you bring an idea to your CPA, what is the reaction? Is the reaction absolutely not, no, not doing it, not reading it, not rah, 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 right? Or is the reaction, oh, um, can you send me that podcast? I'd love to learn about that. I'd love to hear more about that. And then I can go do some research and I can come back to you. And to me, that is always the sign. Every time, for whatever reason, when the CPA goes, rrr, rrr, they're not reading articles. They're not out looking for what's best for you, right? They, they are doing whatever they know that they've been doing for 20 or 30 years, right? And they're not willing to listen to alternatives. Because the alternatives are where all the big bucks are, right? So if you get the CPA that's interested in learning, uh, the next question becomes, well, do you want to be the guinea pig? Or do you want to have your CPA work with somebody who knows what they're doing that then they can also learn, which is good for all their other clients, right? So that, that would be my first point of judgment, I think. That's a cool question to ask. And then based on that response, then, you know, Pick and choose. So that's a really great way to filter. I know that a lot of people, they just want the shortcuts. Like, okay, just give me, what can I do now? What's the low hanging fruit that I can do like right now to, you know, say five or 10 grand, you know, here on my taxes, you know, maybe multiple times in different areas. Do you have any suggestions for people that want the low hanging fruit? Um, I, I do. Hesitation, question mark. Okay. Um, Yes, absolutely. The reason why I'm hesitating, okay? Anytime somebody says, just, just give me the thing I can do in five minutes and that's going to save me five or 10 grand. My initial <laughs> reaction, right? You know where I'm going, Brandon, with this. Obviously. Yeah, nothing in life's free or nothing easy. Nothing in life is if free is. or easy. Absolutely. Because if there was, everybody would be doing it. You'd already know about it. And I think one of the areas of tax strategy specifically that bite people Okay, so, so let's take earlier, we talked about paying kids, okay, $43,000. I have had people call me two years after paying the kids on payroll. I heard you on a podcast. You said I could pay the kids $43,000. I wrote them a check for $43,000. I took it as a deduction on my tax return. Now the IRS is questioning me. What do I do? Okay, don't take advice off TikTok. Don't take advice off a podcast. Don't take advice off YouTube, okay? Paying your kids is not a write a check and now you magically get a deduction. You're, yeah, you got to go through those vehicles, the whole term life insurance, the 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 uh, the you four hundred one ks, etc. Yeah. That you were talking about. Well, and even more basic than that, Brandon, you got to run them through a payroll company, right? Mm. You have to do potentially withholding. <laughs> you might have workers' comp on the kid, depending on which state you're in, right? There's there's all this other stuff, and I think that's one of the biggest pieces of tax strategy paying your kids 
is I think it's an 18 step process when you work with a specialist like me, right? Because we, we lay it out plain English, not tax code, you know, step one, do this, step two, do this, step three, here, fill out this form, do these things, okay? And so when people say, give me, give me those tips to write off five, 10 grand right away, okay, as long as you don't call me in two years from now and try and blame me, yeah. okay? Like, I'll, okay, I'll fair enough, all right, fair, fair enough. enough. There's gonna be some work right. involved, but it's worth it. it, got it. Yeah, so, all right, so let's talk about the most questioned ones that I get asked about, okay? First one is, uh, have kids, they're very expensive, what can I do? Put them on payroll, okay? Next one, I have dogs, they are very expensive. What do I do with the dogs? How do I write off the dogs, okay? Uh, consider writing them off as security, like if you own a junkyard or if your dog is coming with you to client appointments uh, for signing documents, something like that, you could write the dogs off for security. Okay. Now, unfortunately, little tiny chihuahua, fluffy, is not going to work. Okay. <laughs> not going to uh, qualify. Doesn't qualify. <laughs> so, yeah. You're going to need like a German Shepherd or a Rockwaller. Okay. German Shepherd, Roddy, Connie Corso, D Doberman, like whatever, big big puppies. Okay. Um, next one that we always get asked about is how do I write off the Rolex? Right? How do I write off the Rolex? Uh, are you willing to open an eBay business where you're buying and selling Rolexes? And that way you get to wear all new Rolexes every single time, right? You got to have a business interest. It's got to be ordinary, necessary, and reasonable for you to be able to deduct something. So how do I write off the Rolex? How do I write off the car? How do I write off the yacht? Okay. Ordinary, uh, necessary, and reasonable for your business. Business, so, yeah. Yeah. Um, what's the next one? Uh, ooh, enhancements. There's actually a very famous court case. Um, I, I, I'll try to be as professional and least risque as possible. There's a, a very prof a big court case where a professional dancer, if, if you know what I mean, professional dancer, uh, yeah, uh -huh. uh, got some enhancements. Okay, to help her earn some additional cash, earn some money uh, in her. Makes sense. Personal... It made sense to her too. So she wrote it off. Okay. And uh, the IRS did not appreciate that. So they went to court. <clears throat> the IRS lost. The IRS lost this one because the judge turned to the IRS and said, You're telling me she made more money, paid more in taxes because she earned more, she paid more, right? Made more money, paid more in taxes, and you're upset? that she bought a business asset to help her do that and the IRS backed off. So yeah, <laughs> there's almost anything. I think maybe the key here is look at where you spend money, right? Is it on the kids? Is it on the dogs? Is it on the car? Like where are you spending money? Uh, we had a client that used to spend $36,000 a year on Starbucks. Okay. That, that was his jam. That was the deal. Okay. Where are you spending money? Where's your own itch that you can make a business deduction, ordinary, huh. necessary, and reasonable? And how do you get it to be those three things? So Okay. Let's pause on this one. I travel like six weeks a year mm -hmm. okay. for, for, for fun, but sometimes for business. Okay. What would you advise me to do? Oh, let's talk about it. So uh, for fun, it's not a deduction. I would right, say that yeah. right up front. Not and how do I turn the fun? How do I? Oh, uh, exactly. Legally, not, I don't want to go to jail. I don't want to do a 10. I want to keep it a seven. <laughs> We're eight. seven. We're seven. Right? I don't want to call. Okay. Got it. We're seven. I love it, Brandon. I love it. So how do you turn, how do you ensure that travel is properly reported as business? Okay. First one is you got to have a business purpose. So why are you going to London? Okay. I'm going for a podcaster conference. I'm going to meet with one of our investors. I'm going to meet okay. a, a prospect. I'm going to um, a, a Tony Robbins event. <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> excuse me. You got me all amped up because I love travel. Um, actually, I'll tell you how I did it. I have a blog that makes money. <clears throat> Gracious, I'm getting all worked up. I have a blog that is a monetized that is specifically about travel. Right. So it's called Without Bags, if anybody wants to go check it out. So, uh, you know, so in what way can you tie this to business? OK, so that's the first bet. Now, the second thing that most people miss. All right. So let's say you're flying out. We're going to stick with London. Let's say you're flying out to London on a Thursday. OK, you have a business meeting on Friday. You stay Saturday, Sunday and your flight leaves on Monday. You must have another business event on Monday coffee at the airport, whatever it is, okay? You must have another business event on Monday to consider the weekend 
also uh, business. Okay. I see. And yeah. and documented, most important. Documented. Uh, you know, one of my favorite documents that I always do, grab the phone, click, selfie, dinner, whatever it is, right? So, um, yeah. Yep. Very cool. Okay. All right. So I think you paused on like the sixth or seventh, which which was, you know, right off. <laughs> so we talked about travel. Yeah. So I, I guess really the question here is when you're looking at what somebody wants to deduct, it's really about who they are, their lifestyle, uh, how they're running their business, these kinds of things. All right. Um, when you're looking for just overarching deductions, right, what what other kinds of things can we get? Um, some of the most commonly missed things are going to be uh, credits. What about if you're investing in real estate, if you're investing in oil and gas or solar or film, these, these kinds of things, there are credits, which are dollar for dollar deductions. Okay? Mm. Uh, something simple that we see pretty often that gets missed is PTE, pass through entity tax. If you have an S corporation, your S corporation can pay your state taxes, take it as a deduction, and that way you don't get capped by the 10% salt limit. So there's, I think I could sit here and laundry list. And I guess really the question for sure. me always comes down to what are the goals? Who's the person? What are you trying to get to? Right. Cause if yeah. you're in a charity mode, then we're talking charitable trusts, right? It, it, what you, what I took from this was look at where you're spending and is there a way to create some kind of business opportunity out of it? Again, you have to spend a little 100%. work there, but yes. again, it can pay dividends and the tax deductions. Uh, tell us a little bit about the, uh, you, you've got a, an app, I believe that you guys came out for yeah. it that does like the profit first or something like that. You got it. You were so sweet to ask. Thank you. Yeah. So we have a new app. I'm very excited. Uh, it's called Cash Goblin. Give me a second. Oh. Cash Goblin, Cash Goblin. Hopefully you can yeah. see that. Cash Goblin. Uh, what this little guy does is automate your money which makes me very happy. Uh, Profit First, for those of you that don't know about it, it's a guy named Mike Michalowicz wrote a book, Profit First, fantastic system for anybody that's in debt, wants to get out of debt, anybody that's starting a business, anybody that's been in business, but cash flow fluctuates and you want to prevent, you know, protect yourself against those fluctuations. Profit First is just an amazing system. So what the app does is basically says, all right, every day, I get a $100 deposit of every day's deposit or every week's deposit, every month's deposit, whenever you're getting your cash goblins, I want you to take 5% and put it in my uh, retirement account. I want you to take 10% and put it in my um, insurance account to go pay my captive. I want you to take 15% and put it into uh, tax savings, right? To pay the bill, whatever it is. Okay. And one of the things that we love about the profit first method is that it's meant to be automated, but there is no automation for it. So yeah. we created cash goblin and if one So very cool. So money comes in and automatically gets distributed to that account. Cause yep. yeah, the biggest problem with businesses is that they will eat the money, get the money. It will eat the money. And a lot of people it, don't ever done. pay themselves because <laughs> yes. it just disappears. You got to have an owner's profit account, right? Otherwise, what's the point? It's all blood, sweat, and tears and no benefit for it. So yeah, yeah. A lot of people, we, we've been there, including myself. Shauna, it has been an absolute pleasure having you on the show. Oh. If people want to learn more about your book, learn more about you and your business, learn more about Cash Goblin, where can they go? Uh, easiest place, the two websites, I would say. So taxgoddess.com. If you're looking for strategy, you need, you need a CPA that's maybe a little more on the aggressive side, something like that. And uh, of course, cashgoblin.com for the profit first half. So easy to find. Awesome. We'll make sure those get posted. It's been a pleasure having you on the show. Thanks so much, Brandon. Absolutely. Way too much fun. Yes, it's been fun. And if you're listening to this show, Shauna, some love, show me some love. Share this with your friends and family. Leave us a review, and we will see you guys next time.